uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Mikhail Fulger from Princeton University to the Worldwide Center of Mathematics. And uh, he'll be speaking about local volumes. Mikhail, the floor is yours. It's a pleasure to be here and on the web. <laughs> I would like to apologize for not exactly talking about cutting edge research. This was the subject of my thesis about four or five years ago, but there is a local rekindling in, of interest in this subject, so I would like to make a presentation about this. So we start with x, a point on a projective variety. Well, it's not a projective variety, it's just a variety. And x is a closed point. And we know how to compute the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity of x. In the ground scale, the algebraically close the characteristic zero. So later in the talk, I'll need characteristic zero, but um, I'm happy with algebraically closed for now. But just to be sure, let's say we work over C. So there are several ways of defining the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity. One of them is to look at the limit as at the limit as m goes to infinity of the length of Ox mod the maximal ideal supported at the point raised to the power m. Oops, we don't conflict too much with notation by m to the power n over n factorial, and n is the dimension. Another way of looking at it is as negative e to the power n, where e is the exceptional divisor of the blow up. Let's call this y. This is lim or lim soup? Initially, it's lim soup, but one can show that it's a limit. I would like to introduce a new perspective that links these two, and that uses local cohomology. So, instead of looking at it as the appropriately signed top self intersection of E, I would like to see this as a local cohomology invariant. So, first, we observe that the length. Ox mx to the power m. So this can be seen as the global sections over x of that same module. That's a dimension. Exactly, thank you. So it's the dimension of that space. That's because I'm working over an algebraically closed field, for example. Maybe field is enough. Another way of looking at it is as a ratio of h0. But I can't look at x. I need to restrict to an affine neighborhood. So I can see this as h0 u of x by h0 u mx to the power m, where x in u in x, so this is an open affine. And I should also have dimension over here. Okay. Now, if I also assume that x is normal, and we're going to keep this assumption from now on, so assume x is normal, and the dimension n is greater or equal to 2. There was at least one over there. Yeah, I guess it was at least one over there. Thank you. Okay, so if we assume that that is also true, then we have an equality over here with the dimension of global sections of u outside the point x of this shift, mx to the power m. <coughs> by the global sections u mx to the power m. So what's the reason for this? 
mx to the power m and ox agree outside x. And the, the global sections of ox, because x is normal and of dimension at least 2, are, can, can be computed outside any co-dimension 2 or more subset. For example, x, the point x. OK. Now, with this definition, we see that this space is the dimension of the cohomology with support at x on u, mx to the power m. And because local cohomology is local, we have excision. So this is the dimension h1x of x mx to the power m. OK, this. now we see this as an invariant on x. And to relate this to the blob, we, we see the maximal ideal to the power m as a push forward. So this is h1 with support on x. x, the push forward O of m. So here O of 1 is the relative Serre bundle. And this equality is true for all large enough m. Again, dimension. So now if we change the setup a little bit. So new setup. <coughs> so we have pi from y to x, a birational morphism, proper birational. And we have x normal of dimension at least 2. And we have x a close point on x. And we have d a Cartier divisor on y. We can define this dimension, h1x of d. So this is the dimension of h1 with support at x on the base x of the push forward for y of d. And then with this notation, we can define the volume of d, the volume over x of d as lim sup, m goes to infinity, h1x, md by m to the n over m factorial. And because of the previous discussion, we have immediately an example. The Hilbert-Samuel multiplicity of x is the volume over x of a Cartier divisor associated to the relative O of 1. So this is on the blow up of, at x of x. But so why do you call it a volume? I was just wondering that myself. The, the reason for calling it a volume is a, a bit a tradition. <laughs> so in a, on a projective variety, if you have a Cartier divisor, it's traditional to look at global sections of multiples of m and look at its asymptotic growth rate. And that's called the volume. Now on projective varieties, there is a way to interpret that in symplectic geometry. You put a, a metric on d and then you, you integrate that, and you get you get the same invariant. I will mention later that there is a way to see this invariant as uh, the volume of a of a difference of two convex bodies defined in sort of a natural way. So it, it also makes sense to look at it from that perspective of convex geometry. Yeah, actually, maybe one more question. Then, but what volume at x? I mean, that's unusual. Well, the the setup is over x, right? I'm looking at cohomology with oh, y volume at x. Volume of d, I understand. So it would make total sense to call it a multiplicity. I guess I had freedom, <laughs> and I choose the name volume. Let's see 
another example. So let's say V is a projective variety of dimension N, and I pick a polarization H. <coughs> Polarized projective. And I look at X, which is the affine cone over V. Included in some projective space where the O of 1 restricts to this H. So this is none other than the spectrum of the direct sum of global sections on V of, let's say, MH. M greater or equal to 0. This cone has a distinguished point, the vertex. And we can blow it up. So let's say y is the blow up of x of x with morphism pi to x. <coughs> One can show that the blow up at x of x inherits a line bundle structure over v. Let's call that map f. So y is a line bundle over v. And then any divisor on y, any Cartier divisor on y will be pulled back from v, from v. So let, let's say L Cartier on v and put d, the pullback. Then we can compute its local volume. So this is going to be m plus 1 times integral from 0 to infinity of the volume on v <coughs> d minus th, l minus th, dt. So this volume over here is the asymptotic growth rate of global sections on v. Uh, this looks like an indefinite integral, but or improper. <laughs> Looks like an improper integral. That, that's what I meant to say. But in fact, because h is ample, at some point L minus th will stop being effective or big. And then the volume is 0. So I'm, I'm integrating over a finite interval. This will be the basis for, for many of my examples. Just a big question. What if x is a smooth point? Yes. Then what is e of x? Does it depend on? So d is something on a, on a birational model. So it, it depends on d. It just don't deviate, right? So if x is smooth, the dependence on x is gone. But Say the, the variety x, yes. the smooth variety, right? Yeah. It can be. Right? Yeah. Sure. So is e x of d independent of x, little x, then? De de depends on the map. So for example, if you, are, if you have a smooth variety and you blow up a point and you look at the exceptional divisor, over the point you're going to see 1, the Hilbert Samuel multiplicity, and over any other point you're going to see 0. Because there's no d. Yeah, <laughs> there is no d. So let's see some properties of this invariant. divisors on y, and we say that one 
one such is relatively numerically trivial if its intersection with any con curve contracted by pi is zero. And one can show that this is a finite dimensional real vector space. So then the first statement is that the ball x is well defined. And homogeneous <coughs> local ellipsis continuous on that space. Find means it's independent of the numerical class, meaning if I take two divisors that are relatively numerically equivalent, then the volume, local volume will be the same. And homogeneous means that the volume over x of md is m to the n, volume over x of d. Local Lipschitz continuity is the condition that, that you need to say that if a function is continuous on rational numbers, then it extends to a continuous number, function on real numbers. So for example, if you look at 1 over x minus root 2, then if you look at rational numbers, you'll have no problem. But if you want to extend it continuously on at root 2, you will have a problem. And then you, you need some local uniform continuity. I gave you the definition for Cartier divisors using n homogeneity. You define it for rational numbers using this continuity prop, special continuity. You can extend it to real classes. So divisors with R coefficients. Next, we are interested in the monotonicity, monotonicity behavior. So if E is an effective divisor <laughs> on Y, such that pi of x, pi of e is the, the point x, then the volume decreases in this direction. So this is for all d. So I don't have the definition of all x anymore, but it, it's obtained asymptotically from h1x, which I can see as h0. So how do we, on x minus x, have the push forward for ymd, and let's put plus e. by global sections, and let's say x is replaced by an affine u, of the push forward of O of y, and d plus e. And now, if I look at the same diagram with d, then the numerator doesn't observe a difference because e doesn't exist outside x, but this one may increase because I'm adding more sections. So I'm, I'm dividing by more, which means that asymptotically, I mean, at every step it will decrease, so the volume will also decrease. So let's, how should I say this? Let's say that we have a surjection from h0 u minus x pi lower star oymd by h0 u pi lower star oymd. Okay, that's that's what justifies that inequality. Is that inequality supposed to give us some intuition for what the volume of x is measuring? I mean, you had an effective divisor that lies over x, and the volume goes down. Yeah. Yeah. It it stops going down at some point, and it doesn't need to go down to zero. What was the formula 
definition of the space n y n one y over x? Can you explain a little bit more? So we we take d Cartier and y, and we say that d is let's say relatively numerically trivial if d dot c is equal to zero for any c for any curve c that's contracted. So this is a point that doesn't need to be x. I should have mentioned this. So remark. Although the examples that I presented so far, which are the blow up of a point, they were both blow ups of points, have the property that there are isomorphisms outside the point. In general, we don't require that. So pi need not be an isomorphism of x. OK, so that's a parenthesis. So this is a, an equivalence relation. And then n1 y over x. So this is d. I'm not going to take n1 of x, but I'll say Picard of y, modulo numerically, relative numerical equivalence, and then tensor with r over z. So I start the intersections against curves that are contracted by pi. So that's a vector space? Yeah. Uh, the rational is defined with? And it's a finite dimensional. A defect over q. This one is over z. It's, it's torsion free. And then we can tensor with r to make it a vector space. OK. So where was I? So there is a part two to part two. So two prime. If f is effective and pi of f is not x, it's either a divisor on x or a sub variety of or a sub variety of x that's not just the point x then the volume actually increases in that direction. This is not as immediate to explain. It requires a larger diagram. So now, it's a birational invariant. If rho from z to y is proper birational, And the volume over x of the pullback by rho of d is the volume over x of d. We can use this oftentimes to reduce to the, to the case where y is smooth or when y is normal. x is in y now? No. It's still over x? Yeah. What, what happens with space x? So I have still the map i to x and the point x over here. Okay. So I have a Cartier divisor over here, which is the pullback. I can look all the way down over x. I can compare with what happened y over x. Maybe I can add a z here and a y here. We can also understand what, what happens under finite maps. So if f from we already have y. So let's say x prime with a bunch of points, y1 up to yr. To xx <coughs> is finite. And what I mean by this is that it's a finite map of varieties, x prime to x. And the inverse image of x is set theoretically the union of those y's.
no scheme structure is observed. So then, if I take a birational map over here, y, and one over here, y prime, so let's call them pi and sigma, and I manage to find a generically finite lift, so g is generically finite, Then we can compute the volume of a pullback of a divisor on y. So let's say d is Cartier on y. Then if I take the degree of the map F and I multiply with the local volume over X of D, this is the sum I going from 1 to R of the volumes over each YI of the pullback of D. So I think this formula is a, a bit interesting. You would usually expect that when you pull back something, you would observe the multiplicities that may have the ramification indices that may appear over at, at each wise. Somehow they're incorporated into the local volume. They, they don't appear in front. The, the main idea for this is, so idea is that if you compute the dimension h1 over x, on x of the pullback y of md, and your tensor over here with a shift f such that the rank of f, let's say it's r, but maybe not, r, not the same r, let's say s, then asymptotically, Let's also define divide by m to the n over n factorial. Rank of f is s. Then this is s times the volume over x of d. So this is something that was known for projective varieties. If you look at global sections over the entire thing without no, no support, I mean support everything. If you twist your global sections by a sheaf of rank s, then your volume will get multiplied by that. And the shift that shows up over here is precisely the, the pullback of, of x prime on x. OK. So now property 5, vol xd, it's the actual limit. So we don't need lim sup as m goes to infinity, h1 x. The idea over here is pretty complicated. It's what I mentioned before. We give a convex body type interpretation for this local volume. In fact, so idea, write volume over x of d as a normalized volume of a difference. Volume p prime minus volume p, where p prime and p are Okonkov type bodies. H0 u minus x pi lower star o y and d and 
A0U, pi lower star, Y and D. Some projective varieties when you have a graded linear, when you have a graded linear series, there is a natural way of associating to that a convex body, which is called the Okunkov body. It's constructed from a flag and, and your variety. <coughs> Over here, we work with these infinite dimensional spaces of sections. So U is affine, and it contains X. What we're going to get, what we're going to get is infinite convex bodies, but their difference is finite. So a picture. So when X is a, say, toric variety, do you get usual convex bodies? If X is a projective toric variety and you look at global sections, you get the usual convex bodies, the finite toric varieties. Over here, you can also do something like that. In fact, it's a bit more similar to the, the picture you have for computing the hilbert samuel multiplicity for monomial ideals, where you, you, measure, you measure the multiplicity as the area of that's under the Newton polytope polygon. So picture. So we have something like this. So the the bigger one. This is p prime minus p. This would be p. This can go to infinity, but the difference is finite. So volume. Is m factorial times. I already had an m factorial. Volume is one over m factorial of all x of d. Okay. So once you have Okunkov type bodies on the way there, you had semigroups, and for semigroups, people people know that limb soup is a limit. There are technique, better techniques for that. OK, this part so far was algebra. Now let's see some isolated singularities. So what is going on? or some of these people? What? Which part? They haven't looked at erased this. Uh, so it, it, it's pretty easy to, to write this when you have a birational toric morphism. It's, it's pretty easy to write it. It's obtained, especially since you have to look over on, only over an affine toric variety. You have a cone. To make a birational map, you refine it. And to whenever you have a fan, you can obtain a convex body in some way. So to obtain you look at the fan downstairs for the push forward of your divisor seen as a veil divisor. You can repeat that construction. And for P prime, you look at the fan upstairs. But that's it. Maybe it's the other way. It might be the other way around. I might divide the one on X by the one on X prime. Let's move on to the volume of an isolated singularity. <coughs> so in this part of my talk, I'll look at x, which is normal, complex, isolated singularity. You can think of a germ of an isolated singularity. And again, the dimension n is greater or equal to 2. And it is. Excuse me, up to this point, where has the normality come into? Oh, that was to get the local. Yeah, yeah to extend sections from outside x. Other than that, Complex numbers, I think, only appear in uh, only appear in, in the proof that limb soup is a limit, which can probably be fixed anyway by working with an alteration, smooth alteration, and with the behavior under finite maps. But in my, in my proof, I use C just for the last part, where, where I show the 
where I show that the volume, local volume is an actual limit instead of a limb soup. From now on, I, I need complex because I'm working with a lot of resolutions. So let's say pi. The hypothesis that the ground field is algebraically closed, is that just a matter of convenience so that you won't have to pay attention to field extensions of the point? Probably. Uh, okay. It's, it's more like my education. In, it has more to do with my education in algebraic geometry and the, the fact that the references that I use have, have that assumption. So pi from x to e to x, x is a log resolution. So x to is smooth, e sits over x, so e is actually the inverse image of x. It's a divisor. with simple normal crossings. I look, set, I look set theoretically, so I assume that this is reduced. Reduced divisor with simple normal crossings. OK. And we, we define the volume of the isolated singularity as vol x of kx twiddle plus e. So this is the canonical class on x tweedle, which is nice and Cartier because this is smooth. And at E, that's the local volume. This is motivated by the analogous construction actually equal to 2 by Jonathan Wall. So he, he looked at normal sur isolated surface singularities and he defined the local volume with this formula. Of course, he hadn't defined local volumes for arbitrary divisors, but he looked at the limb soup of what goes here. And what goes there are local plurigenera that I'm going to discuss now. So for the motivation. Sorry. Is this somehow related to the topology of the link of the singularity? Yes, it is on, on surfaces. So he shows that for, for surfaces, um, the volume behaves well under finite maps. So if you take a finite map, then the volume downstairs multiplied by the degree is less or equal than the volume upstairs. And uh, he shows that it's a topological invariant of the link. We'll, we'll see that this topological invariance doesn't doesn't lift to higher dimensions. Unfortunately, the, uh, it's a rational singularity. Something like a Casson invariant. He hasn't. I don't think he looked at rational singularities. Yeah. This this is a, a very good. He can use this to define low canonical singularities in a, even in the non Kugorenstein case. So we'll see that if it's Kugorenstein, then the volume is zero, and only if it's low canonical. So it's good for those types of, of singularities. But then it's probably it's probably not necessarily zero for rational, unless rational implies low canonical, which I hope it's not true. <laughs> okay. So I, I was saying that the story over here can also be seen as starting from trying to look at plurigenera. So first, let's start with the genus of the isolated singularity xx. So this is the dimension of the fiber of r n minus 1 pi lower star o x tweedle. So we look at the fiber at x. This is independent of the resolution pi of the singularity. It, uh, it was defined by Yao. So this definition is not, is 
not very illuminating for us. We have to look at, at it a bit differently and maybe see if, if we also have a um, definition for plurigenera. So first, let's look at a different perspective. So let's say U is a small Stein neighborhood. of x, then we can see this plurigenus, so let's call it Tg, xx, so this is the dimension of analytic canonical forms on u outside x. out by square integral, integrable canonical forms outside x. So I think this is actually what Yao proved. So now to define plurigenera, we're going to modify that a little bit. We define delta m xx as the dimension of h0. So we look at pluricanonical forms now. out by L2 over M U minus X. So this space over here, these are holomorphic M canonical forms, omega, such that the integral outside X on U, omega wedge omega bar, to the power one over M less than infinity, so this definition was considered by Watanabe. Okay, this is still not quite illuminating, at least not for me. Okay, then Sakai. And Ishii showed that we can compute delta M, the local plurigenus, as the dimension now in the algebraic category of U minus U twiddle minus E, or X twiddle, and X twiddle. by h0, u twiddle, o x twiddle, m k x twiddle, plus m minus 1 e. Okay, almost there. So we can see this as the dimension of o x m k x mod out by the push forward OX twiddle MKX twiddle plus M minus 1 E. So this is a skyscraper shift centered at X. So it makes sense to talk about the dimension. So this is for choices. FKX twiddle and KX. such that the push forward of kx twiddle as a divisor, not as a sheaf, is kx. Okay. Then it was observed by Ishii that asymptotically this quantity is the same as, so asymptotically lim soup, and goes to infinity. dimension OX MKX by the push forward OX twiddle MKX twiddle plus M minus 1 E. So this is the same as if we remove this minus 1. The 
mentioned it before, the fraction. Okay, and now this is again a um, skyscraper sheaf, I mean, it's centered at a point. Dimension is global sections. Over here, MKX, the global sections of MKX are the same as the global section of MKX Twiddle because they're birational. And that's the same as the global sections defined outside E by normality, by the normality of the base. So I want to say that this is the same as H1 with supports on X of M kx to the plus E. So that again says that if well, I look at the asymptotic growth, I get this formula that I started with. But we see it defined as, we see these guys as plurigenera. Let's see an example. So some very easy to construct uh, isolated singularities are cones over smooth varieties. So say again, the n-dimensional H, this is now a smooth complex projective and polarized. Manifold and XX is the cone. Then the volume of the singularity is M plus one, integral zero to infinity of the volume on V of KV minus TH DT. in particular, but although it's not. Let's take this formula. So we can use this to construct isolated singularities of dimension greater or equal to three that have irrational volume. volume can be irrational. On surfaces, it, it's always rational, as I'll mention. So example. What does it say about the link of the singularity now, the circles? This one, whatever it is. And greater or equal to three? Yeah. So now the volume is not an, an invariant of the link. In dimension a greater or equal to three. Is it obvious why not? It's not obvious, but so if you look, I can construct a family of isolated singularities such that the volume is not constant. The local volume is not constant. The volume of the singularity is not constant. However, whenever you have a family of isolated singularities, the links are apparently always homeomorphic by differential geometry results. You mean a what? You mean a, a family with some kind of triviality condition? So the, the goal is to apply the rs man yeah. yeah, something like that. Yeah. So the, the family that, that I have is the fam, it's a double cover over the family of blow-ups of P2 at three points. And I take some cone over this. I don't know if it's very, if it's very regular, but the starting complex time. Links, right? So what do you vary then in this the, the, the position of the points. So when when the points? And you blow them up. 
how let's take a double cover. Can can draw a picture? I'm not so sure. Points, it doesn't matter. Like that. I mean, uh, you do some kind of cross ratios or what? So when the points are collinear, you get one answer. When the, when they're when they're not collinear, you get another answer. I'm just objecting to when you have any family of isolated singularities, the real links don't change in the family. That's just not true. I mean, you talk about the homeomorphism type. The homeomorphism type of the link. Yeah. It's not going to be a Milok type. Yeah, but so I I stole this from somewhere. I, I can't claim. <laughs> if, if you mean in a, in a fixed big ball, you can move that, but then you have to go smaller to get the complex link. I mean, the real link. Maybe I'll I'll look at the paper and at the paper that I'm referencing, and I'll, I'll tell you what happens. It's probably important that the the. The family of P2s blown up at three points is, is smooth Take over the base. Take nodes to generate into a cusp. You know, the, the real link is two link circles for the node, and you get down to the cusp, and it's one circle. So I don't think it. I don't think it's imp it, it's that important that I have a family of isolated singularities rather than I, ha I have a family of isolated singularities obtained from a smooth family, not of isolated singularities, but the family here would be the family of blow-ups of P2 at three points. I guess it depends on what you mean by a smooth family for isolated. I mean, for singular things, but OK. I start with a small family, then I take cone over that. And somebody claims that that implies that the links are the same. It's not me. <laughs> I claim through them. Yes, if you take something that's constant, and then you take cones over it, and then you look at the links, you go, Okay. 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 Good. So now let's look at the case n equal to. Okay. Yep. Sorry, but uh, but if I give you uh, the real number, can you realize it as a body x for x for some x? I'm not sure. If you give me a num, if you give. I don't know. So for example, on, on projective varieties, the set of volumes that, that you could get, it's known to be countable, although you could get any rational number and some transcendental ones. <laughs> then they know that the set of all of them is, is countable. I haven't looked at the equivalent result over here. I can tell you that if you have a number, you can also multiply it. So if you get, sorry, if you get a number via this cone thing, if you replace the polarization by 2h, then I think you're dividing by two, your, your volume, or so by two to the end. Itself, right? The set of numbers you get. I mean, a rational, okay. some, yeah, something like that. So these examples are independent of Kutowski's work? The, the, students, the, the, the irrationality over here is, again, a cone over a double cover of an abelian variety yeah. alone. Kutkowski. So I think that starts that idea starts from him. Although in, in, in this case it appears in work of Stefano Urbinati, who was at Utah, not a, not a student of Kutkowski. Not for Volex, but the idea of looking at the double cover of a self product of elliptic curves. Start Stefano Urbinati. No, He's young. He's example. Kutkowski looks at projective bundles over that, and we look at double covers and then cones over that. So you have E cross E. E is an elliptic curve. The Picard rank over here is 3, 3, and the cone, the effective cone, is round. You take two general ample classes. You're, you do a cyclic cover with respect to double cyclic cover with respect to two times one of them. So let's say this is D and this is H. You do a cyclic cover, double cover with respect to D, and then you take the affine cone over the pullback of H. And if these are general enough, then that integral will 
will become irrational, taking advantage of the fact that if you move in that direction, you may hit the boundary in an irrational point. Even if this were integral Cartier, this may be irrational. For volume, some projective varieties could Koski also takes advantage of this formula, but in a different direction. He gets some integral that appears when he, when he takes the direct sum O of D plus O of minus H and projectivize that, the relative O of 1. When you compute sections and take the asymptotic form, you'll get to some formula of this type. He gets a quadratic irrationality. Yeah, it's a yes, so round cone. Do you always have algebraic integers? I don't know. I don't see how you could, you know, polynomial, how you could fit the volex into a polynomial. Okay. Maybe let's leave examples for now. I talked about them. Let's see some of the properties of volex. Of the local volume of the isolated singularity. So if you have f x x to y x y y, a finite map of isolated singularities, and what this means is that it's finite, and the inverse image of y is just x, so totally ramified at x. Okay, then the volume x x is greater or equal to the degree of f times the volume y y. You might object and r recall that that before we had we saw something like this where we have we had an equality. What happens over here is that the pullback of this class from y to x is not it's not the corresponding class on x. It differs by it differs it differs by some exceptional things and by some negative effective things that are not over x and using the so for that we use the uh, ramification formula and then the inequality comes from the monotonicity properties of the local volume i think the argument is a bit cleaner than in wall's work we also observe that on surfaces there is an advantage that comes from working with local volumes. If you don't, then you start introducing some limits of some quantities. Local volume streamline that computation. Okay, then when is this zero? So first, in the context of the previous, in, in the previous setting, if volume of x is zero, then the volume of y is also zero. That's, that's because the inequality. The volume of x is zero, if and only if h1x and kx tweedle plus e is zero for all m greater or equal to zero. So this is saying that the only way that the volume is zero is if the function whose asymptotic growth of radius measures is identically zero. This should be a bit surprising. And that happens if and only if the push forward of OX tweedle and KX tweedle plus E is OX and KX for any m greater or equal to zero. If additionally x, x is Q Gorenstein, <coughs> then this happens. So volume of x is zero if and only if x is low canonical. For surfaces, you don't know whether this can be greater than zero? It can be greater than, than zero. You take 
some cone over a finite curve. So I mean, this, that volume can't, that doesn't have to be zero. But you said there was an open question of whether every resolution of the rational singularity is not canonical. So I think there, there, was, there was a recent theorem that says that rational implies something, but it might be terminal, not canonical. By Shandor Kovac. Maybe, maybe somebody knows the statement better than I do. But I think that it can happen that the volume of rational singularity is not zero. Okay. So if we pair this statement with this one over here and assume that y is also Hugh-Gorenstein, then we see that the image of a log canonical singularity is log canonical by a finite map. Okay. So let's look. Is there a straight way to see that? A straightforward way to see that? I don't think so. That sounds like a roundabout way to see that the image of local canonical is local canonical. I think we we'll all use the perspective of local volumes to, so, to see that on surfaces. Okay. So let's look more at Wall's example. So he defines. Let's put index wall. He initially defines the volume of an isolated singularity as negative p dot p, where p is the positive part of the pi Zariski decomposition. <laughs> of kx tweedle plus e. So you can write kx tweedle plus e as p plus n, when, where p is pi n f, which means that the intersection with any curve contracted by pi is non-negative, and n is an effective divisor. So we have n, if n is effective and pi exceptional. is just a divisor with the property that pn is equal to zero and p dot c is great or equal to zero for any pi of c is equal to a point, which in this case I guess it's x. I was looking at a log resolution which can be chosen to be an isomorphism outside x. And then I guess it's a theorem of wall, wall. That the two definitions agree. I would like to mention that Buxom Johnson, Buxon, Favre, de Fernet, have generalized the negative p dot p definition to arbitrary dimension. So this leads to a notion that I'll call capital volume of xx. The definition is much more involved than this. The relative Zariski decompositions no longer exist if we look at just one resolution. So then they have to look at all of them simultaneously and construct some asymptotic definition from that. So I showed that the volume, their volume, is also great or equal to vo my volume. So the capital V notation is deserved. 
this says that their volume is better, unfortunately. So it says that the vanishing of their volume says more than the vanishing of, of my volume. And in fact, they construct examples. So here, example. From the Fernet Favre, inequality may be strict. However, they show that inequality holds in the Hugh Gorenstein case. Equality holds if x, x is Q Gorenstein. On the other hand, because their definition of the volume has to take into account all resolutions of x, this is pretty hard to compute outside, outside this case. However, for some cone singularities using not this volume but vol x for different divisors, I was able to compute that and show that it may also be rational even when this doesn't hold. So example. We may have well, x, x strictly bigger than well, x strictly bigger than zero, and both of them irrational. Although I haven't really found examples when one is irrational and the other one is rational, but at least we have strict inequality. I think I'll stop here. Okay, questions, comments? So if you have an ideal with uh, a finite cone-like space and go up the ideal, yes. then you use that exception to find it. Yep. And drawing the series. Yes. Which is yeah, I should, I should have said that. That's good. Also, if, if you have an, an ideal and you blow it up, yeah. and you look an ideal that's not unitary and primary, and you blow it up, and you look at the exceptional divisor and you measure the local volume just over x, yes. then you get the epsilon multiplicity signed by Kutkowski. So you recover, the, at least in rank one, the fact that link soup is a limit in that case. Do you have a So if you have something which is not in primary, and you look at, at what the volume is at different points, is there any good linkage between the answers you're getting and the, the structure of the exceptional divisors over the point? Well, I'm thinking so if, if it, is that, is that somehow, you, somehow you might have a situation where at, the, at, the, at, at x you have a vertical component to the yep. exceptional divisor, then you're buying a vertical component. But you maybe got something. Is can you So if you look at the normalized blow up yes. and if that doesn't observe divisorial components over some point, then the local volume will be zero over that point. Okay. So th there are only finitely many points over, over which the volume can be non zero. Yep, yep, very vertical. <laughs> okay. All right, I'll let somebody else ask a Yep. So can you explain a bit more about this parachute? Invalidance of this volume. Do you understand correctly? Yeah. So I take x for example, and then I blow up a sub variety that contains the point x. Yes. Uh, does the volume change or not? No, but it's a. You have to see it in a di different way. Is it obvious? Or <laughs> it comes from the same result where where I put that the asymptotic growth rate is multiplied by the rank if I tensor by something. If I tensor by some coherent sheaf, and if I have a birational map, then the push forward of the canonical is rank one, and it's actually OX if it has connected fibers. Well, there we go. <laughs> <laughs> so you have XX, X, and you have Y, and you want to blow up some Z inside X, yeah. then you would first have to find a, find a common model. Okay. And then you would have that the Local volume over here is the same as the pullback of the local volume over there, which I guess you can also see through that direction. I mean, you really have your Cartier divisor over there, so 
you can start with one over there, but what does it mean to be birational invariant? Or you could start with one over there and you get, you actually get zero because. But, so, but the, so the volume changes as a little x runs around big x, right? Not too much. Yep. Uh, there are only see, on sometimes it's rational, irrational. I mean, now there's some kind of walls where, you know, uh, the, the set of points where the volume is. So what, what does it want to be? Zero? It yeah. wants to be zero. If you have if you have d over over there, let's say y is normal, yeah. then the vo local volume of d over x can only be non-zero if there is a divisorial component over x. So there are only finitely many such points. It doesn't have to be non-zero even if there is a divisorial component. I, I can give you a criteria. I can almost give you a criterion. But the volume is defined independently of this d. So it's just volume of x comma x. Oh, now we're looking at the singularity. Okay, okay. I'm looking at the singularity. Okay. So now, if I vary x, I mean, when does the volume jump? So I didn't mention that if x is a smooth point, then it's zero. Yeah, and I'm only working with isolated singularities. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> But how about oh, I see. But the non isolated case, you don't know how to handle. Not really. No. But you, so can, you, can, you can. You can. You need to take slices. You can make the, the definition. Point, take slices, cut it down to an isolated singularity. Uh, look at the strict transform of everything. Now you have yourself a vertical component again. I, I don't know very well how the local volume behaves under hyper restricting to hyperplanes. Yeah. It, if, if you had. If you had if you oh, okay, so you have you have you have the singularity, and so you move a little bit from the point you're interested in, and then you take enough hyperplanes, mm -hmm. uh, intersect with the hyperplanes. So you know it, it does. It is always true the intersection of the isolated singularity. How often it is. So that, that's not the biggest problem. The problem is I don't know how the local volume behaves under restricting to hyperplanes. Oh, I see. That's the problem. Well, that's a serious problem. Yep. You don't have a, like a Zariski type theorem. Terry would no. certainly hope it doesn't change along Whitney's strat. Right. <laughs> I certainly hope it doesn't. Yeah, but so, uh, I have a question about the vanishing of the volume. Uh, yep. Beyond the cube Gorenstein case, do you know other examples where you can have vanishing of the volume? So, if you look at on, on surfaces, there are non Q Gorenstein surfaces that are called low canonical. So, if you, if you know their classification, I don't know exactly which are which. Like elliptic singularities or something like that, maybe are not low canonical. They're, they will have volume zero. Okay. In fact, Wall defines a normal isolated surface, surface singularity to be low canonical if it has his volume is zero. I see. If it's also Q Gorenstein, it's the same as in the old sense. In higher dimensions, it's pretty. So I think in higher dimensions, little volume wants to tell you that x is almost low canonical. And I think the books on the Fernet Favre, they think that the vanishing of their local volume has more to do with log terminal. Mm -hmm. Are there more questions? Well, uh, is, is there a question? Yeah. yeah. So, when is the epsilon multiplicity a limit? Does that, uh, do you get conditions for that statement? So, in, in the ideal in, case, right? In, in the ideal case. In the ideal case. Yeah. If you want to look in uh, for higher ranks modules, we're trying to look now at what happens when you when you look at local volume and this map is not birational. It's not that it's not as easy to work with. So you'd look at the proj. Yep. So as a follow-up to that last remark, can you capture the book spot with multiplicity of a module in this in your setting? I'm not so you, have a, you have a sub a sub module, a free module, which has finite coupling, so it's only supported at the origin, say can we have, I mean you can do it for ideals, if it's an ideal you can yep. you can capture can you capture the book spot with multiplicity of that module? Yeah, I think he can express it, uh, but he needs a slight generalization of his construction. Yeah, it would seem yeah. that way. That's why I was, he mentioned the idea of looking at the branch of, of the result, or perhaps of that thing, and that gives us something which... Of higher relative dimension. Right. Yes, that's yeah. right. Yeah, so maybe. So on, on the list of properties of local volumes, I think I managed to show that it's finite. <laughs> that, that's about it. Maybe. 
maybe I can also check the things that give homogeneity and the thing that if you tensor by a sheaf, then it's the same as the rank times. But it's I'm pretty early in that in that list. Okay, there are no other questions. Let's thank Mikhail again. <laughs>